All right, in this video, we're going to get into details about antibody structure and production and how they function. So remember, antibodies are just uh, complex proteins that are produced by B lymphocytes or B cells in the immune system. And um, if you didn't see it, go back to um, the most recent video before this one in this playlist, and we go through a detailed overview of how um, B cells are activated and why antibody production even starts. Um, the short story of that is, for a B cell to start producing lots of copies of its antibody, we want the antibody to bind its antigen, right? And the antigen is just whatever molecule the B cell happens to bind to. In the case of an infection, the antigen is usually a protein on the surface of a pathogen, like a bacterium or a virus, but it could be some sort of foreign molecule that a person has an allergy to. Um, you can even have self antigens, right? Proteins within the person um, that sometimes respond to antibodies, um, sometimes detrimentally. Okay, so structure-wise, um, our antibody is actually made of four separate proteins. Um, two of them are light chains, these guys, light just because they're small, and two of them are heavy chains, um, just because they're large. The next clarifier is everything that you see down here in blue, um, we call that the constant region. And we say that it's constant because it never changes. Every antibody in every B cell has the same constant region. And that's important because this is the end of the antibody um, that your immune system recognizes. So we don't really want it to be changing around all the time. Right? Um, everything that you see up here in yellow, that is the variable region. And variable because it changes from one B cell to the next. And so every B cell makes a unique antibody that has a unique variable region or antigen binding site, right? And the reason for this is you need millions and millions of different antibodies in order to be able to recognize millions and millions of different antigens, right? And the shape of that binding site is what makes the antibody unique. So when we say that we activate B cells and make them divide and copy their antibodies, we want to very specifically activate only the B cells that have the correct antibody that matches our antigen of interest, okay? And there are a nearly infinite number of antigens, and within the antigens, you even have many epitopes. Um, epitopes are like specific binding sites on an antigen. So if this was um, our uh, protein, fantastic artwork, I know. Um, the idea is you might have antibodies that bind here, and a different antibody that binds here, and a different one that binds here, each of those specific binding sites would be a different epitope, right? And so on one pathogen, you might have hundreds or thousands of different antigens. And on each antigen, you might have hundreds or thousands of different epitopes, um, combining to make tens or hundreds of thousands of possible binding sites, um, which makes sense why, you know, not every human has the same antibodies, but we don't need them to, to be the same in every person. We just need to find some antibodies that bind to at least a couple epitopes on a couple of the antigens on our pathogen. That way the immune system has something to recognize. All right, so the interesting question about this is, um, if we have millions of different antibodies, um, antibodies are proteins, and you probably remember from a genetics class, proteins have to be encoded by genes. So how can you have um, millions and potentially um, trillions of different possible antibodies that could be made, right? No one has all trillion, um, but that's how many could be potentially made if you um, surveyed all humans across the world. In order to do that, we can't rely on having a different gene for every antibody because there just aren't enough genes to go around, right? Humans only have about 20,000 genes. And so the way this works is through a process called recombination. Um, the genes that eventually code for antibodies are much, much, much larger than they actually need to be. And what we do is, um, every time a B cell matures, like from stem cells and bone marrow, most of the DNA in the genes that code for its antibody are removed. So when they say removal of unwanted um, D and J segments, um, these different V, D, and J segments are the different parts of the DNA in this gene that could code for the antibody. But again, we have way more than we need. And so the idea is um, this cell randomly takes a handful of bits and pieces from these different V, D, and J segments in the gene, cuts most of them out, 
um, recombines or effectively scrambles the remaining parts that are left. And by the end of it, you get a unique combination of V, D, and J sites that code for um, the variable region on the antibody that we just looked at, right? And since this entire process happens randomly, it's like grabbing, you know, random letters out of a bag. Um, you could spell uh, almost an you know, infinite number of different combinations of letters or numbers um, if you pulled them out randomly like a lottery machine. And so this whole process is basically an antibody lottery. You make the antibody randomly, not knowing what it's going to bind to because we can't predict the future. And the idea is you do this millions of times for millions of different B cells. And then when a person gets an infection, right, whatever antibodies just by sheer luck happen to bind the antigen, those are the ones that get amplified, right? And this, um, this summary um, of how many different segments we have, how many different recombination points there are, junctional diversity tells you how they can be linked together. The total, the conclusion in the end is um, you have 10 to the 14th, talking about trillions, um, tens, hundreds of trillions um, of different antibodies that can be made because of all these possible different ways that we can take that DNA and recombine it. Right? So this explains, again, why we call the copying of B cells clonal expansion, because technically every B cell is slightly different than other B cells genetically. And so when you get an infection, you don't want to just copy any B cell. You want to clone the one that has the matching antibody that recognizes your antigen on your pathogen that you're trying to get rid of. Okay, so um, a workaround, a thing that we need to... Um, sort of consider in all of this. Self-antigens. Remember, um, human cells are coated with proteins as well. And when the immune system first starts developing, it has no way of knowing which antigens are foreign, which ones are supposed to be there. And so what effectively happens is um, during fetal development before birth, when the fetus should hopefully not be infected by anything, you're making lots of new B cells and T cells. Um, and we need to eliminate or get rid of any of those B and T cells that by chance, by bad luck, happen to recognize self-antigens. Because if you have antibodies or T cells that recognize self-antigens, um, that would lead to autoimmunity, right? The mistaken attack of your own tissues by the immune system. And so what we do is we have a separate class of MHCs called self-MHCs, right? And they're the opposite of what normal MHCs do. But a normal MHC that shows off foreign antigens when they bind their antigen and find a matching B cell or T cell, it's a stimulatory thing. Make the B cell or T cell divide because we want to attack the pathogen. Here, the goal is we want to get rid of these cells. Right? Any B cell or T cell that has uh, an antibody or a receptor that binds a self antigen, it's got to go. And so if a B cell or T cell matches this self MHC, it triggers apoptosis, which is cell death. Right? And so it's basically a way to knock off and kill those um, self-recognizing B cells and T cells as a way to prevent autoimmune reactions going forward in the future. All right. Now, this becomes an issue um, for a few other different um, considerations. The development of tumor cells, the immune system recognizing tumors is very difficult, um, in part because a lot of the antigens on the tumor cell aren't mutated. They look like normal um, human proteins, and so they're hard to recognize. Um, it's also an issue for the immune system rejecting transplants because if um, the person who is the donor who's giving the kidney or the lung or the heart, um, if they have different antigens than the recipient, then the immune system isn't going to recognize them as self. It's going to recognize them as foreign. Um, that's why it's important to make sure the donor and recipient are as close to a perfect match as possible. All right. Okay. Next issue, um, antibodies can change over time. There's a very cool mechanism called affinity maturation. And affinity really just means binding strength. Um, how tightly does the antibody bind the antigen? And what ends up happening is if you come back months, years later after the infection, especially if a person's got the same infection multiple times, the antibodies just keep getting better and better. And the way it happens is um, you intentionally mutate the genes that code for antibodies to the tune of um, a million times faster than they would just by chance. Now, this sounds crazy, but remember, um, natural selection thrives on variation and mutations. 
this mutation is just creating variations in the B cell population, hoping that by chance, um, some of them have higher affinities than the original did, right? And remember, binding to the antigen is what triggers cell division. And so if your antibody just by chance happens to have higher affinity, it's going to bind the antigen more, which is gonna make it divide more. Now, if you get unlucky and it doesn't have a high affinity, then it's just not going to get copied and it'll kind of fade away. And so you end up getting this natural selection effect where the B cells that happen to have the best antibodies just by luck um, are copied and divide the most. And so they spread throughout the body and make the immune response stronger. Okay, so let's try to put this all together. Um, what we're looking at here is a graph of antibody levels. Right, this got cut off, but it should say um, antibody concentration in serum. So this is how many antibodies are in your blood. And the idea is um, when you're first exposed to an antigen, so when you get an infection for the very first time, you have um, this lag phase, right? And the lag is saying it might take, um, you know, a handful of days or a week or even more before you start producing antibodies because clonal expansion takes time. Um, this lag phase is when cell division is happening, right? B cells and T cells are dividing. They're trying to increase their numbers so that you can start producing plasma cells and secrete antibodies. Right now, there are a few different subtypes of antibodies. It's probably not that big of a deal because they have a similar function, um, but they vary a little bit in their structure. So initially, the first antibodies that get produced are called IgMs, and they rise and fall pretty quickly. When they start falling, you produce a second, more longer lasting category of antibody called IgGs. And in total, um, these antibodies will hang around for several weeks. That should be about the time that the infection is cleared, right? Now, the second part of this is if you're exposed to the same antigen again, so same virus, same bacteria, notice that this lag phase is much shorter now. Right? Instead of being you know, 10 days, like they're illustrating over here, we're down to only a couple days at the most. And the reason for that is you have memory cells, right? memory B cells and T cells that are sitting around waiting to divide, and so you can produce antibodies much faster. So what this means is the second time you're exposed, uh, you technically still get an infection, but because you can produce an antibody response um, that quickly, you crush the infection before it comes bad enough to actually give you symptoms, right? And so um, that's why having immunity or being vaccinated, it can't prevent you from getting the pathogen inside your body. All it can do is fight it off before it multiplies so much that you become symptomatic. Right. All right, as always, hope this was helpful. Um, follow along on the playlist, um, watch them in order, and subscribe to the channel to make sure you get um, all the videos um, they tell a story in order, so watch them in sequence.